1. The Saint and the Scorpion Once upon a time, there was a wandering ascetic monk on his way in the range of Himalayas. One beautiful morning on a sunny day, he came across a shallow river which he had to cross to move further. The moment he was about to enter his feet in the river, he mindfully noticed a scorpion helplessly treading the water and struggling to come out of the river. It was almost touching the bank, but not enough to gain hold of the ground. The sage knew that the scorpions can't swim, and if he didn't save the scorpion, it would drown. The saint decided to save it. Therefore, the saint carefully picked up the struggling scorpion in his left palm with the intention to place it on the nearby dry land. When the monk was just about to set it down gently on dry land, all of a sudden the scorpion stung his finger and rushed off the palm in rage, landing in the water again. It resumed its struggle to come out of water. The sage caressed his ailing left hand with his right. His body was in extreme pain, but his mind was calm and composed. Bearing in mind that the scorpion could lose its life, this time the sage used right hand to lift the scorpion out of river water. However, the scorpion panicked and stung again. Once again, it sped off the palm and fell in the river water, resuming its struggle to come out. The monk was left with both his hands singed with unbearable pain. But Sage was not the one to give up. He tried to save the scorpion again. This time, he cupped his hands together and lifted the scorpion in one swift movement. Before Scorpion could react, the monk safely dropped it on the dry land. The scorpion disappeared into the pebbles that lay near the bank. The Sage felt ecstatic, for he succeeded in carrying out his perseverance and saving the scorpion's life. He thought it was worth the pain. At a distance, oblivious to the sage, a man, surprised and shocked, had watched the whole episode. He swiftly approached the monk and said, Pray, can I ask you a question, please? Yes, you may, replied the monk. The man said, First of all, in my opinion, there was no need to save a scorpion. It's good for nothing and does not do well to anybody. Secondly, if you tried to save him out of kindness or compassion, you could have tried simply once. I'm quite surprised that even after it stung you so ungratefully, you persisted with your efforts to save him. Please tell me the reason. Why? How come you did not just stomp on it after it stung you? Oh, that's pretty simple, my dear child, the sage replied, gently rubbing his stung hands against each other. This was a scorpion, a creature whose nature is to sting, to give pain, to panic, and to harm other. It is known for not showing any signs of kindness or compassion. It is supposed to be weak, whereas I am a monk who is supposed to spread unconditional love, kindness, and compassion everywhere. I am supposed to be the strong one. With my values and principles, my philosophy and ethics, my lifestyle and practices, my elevated emotional and mental state, I am supposed to cleanse and transform the other individual. Am I right, young man? The young man nodded in agreement. The monk continued, Well then, when a creature as small, weak, and lowly as a scorpion does not change its basic nature, its traits, and its reactions in the presence of a holy man, should I, the one who is supposed to be a sage, let go off my virtuous conduct, my behavior in the presence of a scorpion? Am I now so helpless to allow a stingy creature to change me, shrug off my principles and virtues? Scorpion did what its basic nature is, and I did what is my basic nature. It retained its behavior, and I, mine. My dharma is to help any creature of any kind, human or animal, and that is what I did. The man prostrated at the feet of the saint and expressed his gratitude for the profound wisdom just saint shared with him. While we interact with different people in day-to-day -day life, it's normal to have disagreements. Rather, I must say, it's pretty natural. You will come across different type people resembling from scorpions to saints, grateful to thankless, weak to strong, good to bad, and so forth. If they are able to change your behavior, provoke you, make to react, throw you off balance, 
they are much stronger than you. In difficult conditions or during conflict situations, if you keep your calm and retain your goodness, you will emerge as a winner. You should never let your actions, thoughts, and words to be affected by the negative behavior of others. The darkness in others' hearts should not be allowed to penetrate into the lightness of your heart. If you lower yourself down to their level, treating them the way they have treated you, this will invariably mean they have won because you have become like them. 2. The Reflections Once a dog ran into a museum filled with mirrors. The museum was unique. The walls, the ceiling, the doors, and even the floors were made of mirrors. Seeing his reflections, the dog froze in surprise in the middle of the hall. He could see a whole pack of dogs surrounding him from all sides, from above and below. The dog bared his teeth and barked all the reflections responded to it in the same way. Frightened, the dog barked frantically. The dog's reflections imitated the dog and increased it many times. The dog barked even harder, but the echo was magnified. The dog tossed from one side to another while his reflections also tossed around, snapping their teeth. The following day, the museum security guards found the miserable, lifeless dog, surrounded by thousands of reflections of the lifeless dog. There was nobody to harm the dog. The dog died by fighting with his own reflections. The world doesn't bring good or evil on its own. Everything that is happening around us reflects our thoughts, feelings, wishes, and actions. The world is a big mirror. So let's strike a good pose. 3. The Pursuit of Happiness by Chris Gardner The future was uncertain, absolutely, and there were many hurdles, twists, and turns to come. But as long as I kept moving forward, one foot in front of the other, the voices of fear and shame, the messages from those who wanted me to believe that I wasn't good enough, would be stilled. Summary The Pursuit of Happiness is a memoir by Chris Gardner that was published in 2006. It's an inspiring story that details Gardner's journey from homelessness to success as a stockbroker. The memoir describes the challenges he faced as a single father trying to provide for his son while struggling with poverty, homelessness, and no college degree. Theme Gardner's Rags to Riches story portrays a life of resilience and perseverance. Despite facing seemingly insurmountable obstacles, he refused to give up on his dreams and continued to work hard toward achieving them. He showed incredible resilience in the face of adversity and remained determined to create a better life for himself and his son. Moral of the story. This story shows that with hard work, determination, and a positive attitude, anyone can achieve their dreams, no matter how difficult or impossible they may seem. It encourages readers to pursue their passions, never give up, and believe in themselves, even when others may doubt them. 4. A Dish of Ice Cream In the days when an ice cream sundae cost much less, a 10-year-old boy entered a hotel coffee shop and sat at a table. A waitress put a glass of water in front of him. How much is an ice cream sundae? 50 cents, replied the waitress. The little boy pulled his hand out of his pocket and studied a number of coins in it. How much is a dish of plain ice cream? he inquired. Some people were now waiting for a table, and the waitress was a bit impatient. Thirty-five cents, she said brusquely. The little boy again counted the coins. I'll have the plain ice cream, he said. The waitress brought the ice cream, put the bill on the table, and walked away. The boy finished the ice cream, paid the cashier, and departed. When the waitress came back, she began wiping down the table and then swallowed hard at what she saw. There, placed neatly beside the empty dish, were 15 cents, her tip. 5. A Useless Life A Useless Life is a Zen story about wisdom and compassion. A farmer got so old that he couldn't work the fields anymore, so he would spend the day just sitting on the porch. His son, 
still working the farm, would look up from time to time and see his father sitting there. He's of no use anymore, the son thought to himself. He doesn't do anything. One day the son got so frustrated by this that he built a wood coffin, dragged it over to the porch, and told his father to get in. Without saying anything, the father climbed inside. After closing the lid, the son dragged the coffin to the edge of the farm where there was a, a high cliff. As he approached the drop, he heard a light tapping on the lid from inside the coffin. He opened it up. Still lying there peacefully, the father looked up at his son. I know you are going to throw me over the cliff, but before you do, may I suggest something? What is it? replied the son. Throw me over the cliff if you like, said the father, but save this good wood coffin. Your children might need to use it. There is almost no limit to the compassion parents have for their children. Having kids makes you care for your family beyond your own death. 6. Build Like a Child On a warm summer at a beautiful beach, a little boy on his knees scoops and packs the sand with plastic shovels into a bucket. He upends the bucket on the surface and lifts it. And, to the delight of the little architect, a castle tower is created. He works all afternoon spooning out the moat, packing the walls, and building sentries with bottle tops and bridges with popsicle sticks. Finally, with his hours of hard work on the beach, a sandcastle will be made. In a big city with busy streets and rumbling traffic, a man works in an office. He shuffles papers into stacks, delegates assignments, cradles the phone on his shoulder and punches the keyboard with his fingers. He juggles with numbers, contracts get signed, and much to the delight of the man, a profit is made. All his life, he will work. He was formulating the plans and forecasting the future. His annuities will be centuries and capital gains will be bridged. An empire will be built. The two builders of the two castles have very much in common. They both shape granules into grandeurs. They both make something beautiful out of nothing. They both are very diligent and determined to build their world. And for both, the tide will rise and the end will come. Yet, that is where the similarities cease. The little boy sees the end of his castle while the man ignores it. As the dusk approaches and the waves near, the child jumps to his feet and begins to clap as the waves wash away his masterpiece. There is no sorrow, no fear, no regret. He is not surprised. He knew this would happen. He smiles, picks up his tools and takes his father's hand and goes home. The man in his sophisticated office is not very wise like the child. As the wave of years collapses on his empire, he is terrified. He hovers over the sandy monument to protect it. He tries to block the waves with the walls he made. He snarls at the incoming tide. It's my castle, he defies. The ocean need not respond. Both know to whom the sand belongs. Go ahead and build your dreams, but build with a child's heart. When the sun sets and the tides take, applaud. Salute the process of life and go home with a smile. 7. Two Shoe Salesmen At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a successful American shoe manufacturer company that manufactured and sold shoes. Due to market changes, the sales of company went down sharply. The management was concerned about the decline in company's product sales in America. A board meeting called up to discuss this issue. In the board meeting, a new business strategy emerged out to explore and open new markets abroad. It was decided to send two salesmen to Africa to determine the market potential for their products. The sales director called his two top salesmen and proposed that they travel to Africa and assess the market there to increase their sales. Both salesmen left by boat for Africa with instructions to make a first survey of the market. Each of them would go to a different country to have two opinions about the potential of the African market. Within a month of arriving, the first salesman completed a basic survey of the target market and called his sales director, 
informing him that after several days visiting cities, he had concluded that the African potential for shoe sales was null. The first salesman said, Boss, there is a bad news. Here they all go barefoot. No one here wears any shoes. There is no market for us here. We are not going to be able to sell a single pair of shoes. The salesman was sounding very dejected and disheartened. After a couple of days, the second of the salesmen called back to the sales director. He was extremely excited and said, Boss, good news. It's fantastic place and a great business opportunity for us. No one here wears shoes. No one sells shoes. There is a huge potential market for us. We are going to sell thousands of pairs. What all we need to do is to educate them on the benefits and importance of wearing shoes. This inspiring short story highlights the importance of attitude in our life. Why do some people get what they want while others don't? An optimistic attitude makes you see opportunities in all the difficulties that life holds around you, whereas a pessimistic attitude makes you see difficulties in all the new opportunities that life holds for you. There is also a famous Henry Ford quote that emphasizes how much attitude determines success or failure. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. There are opportunities everywhere. When you are mindful enough to explore them, you will find the one. It all starts with that optimistic attitude. You will find the right people, you will move in the right circles, and you will bump into the right solutions. The story also encouraged to look at the things in totality. There is always a positive perspective and a negative perspective to everything and every circumstance. You can either look at a glass as half full or half empty, but technically the glass is always full. You can look at the whole of the donut or in totality the donut itself. The choice is yours and yours alone. But remember that the choices you make will determine your success or failure. Look at the things in a holistic way and tap the opportunities. In the story. Of course, Salesman 2 was a real entrepreneur, the person who sees opportunity where others do not. It's a story designed to motivate you to find hidden potential, take risks, and turn obstacles into opportunities. 8. Value of your life One day a son went to his father and asked, What is the value of my life? Instead of answering, the father gave him a stone and said, If you want to know the value of your life, take this stone and go to the market to sell it. If anyone asks you for the price, don't say a word, just raise two fingers. However, do not accept any offer and bring the stone back to me. The boy went to the market. He looked around and suddenly an old woman approached him and asked, How much is this stone? I want to put it in my garden. The boy didn't say anything and raised two fingers, so the woman said, Two dollars? I'll take it. The son got surprised. He rushed back to his father and said, there was an old woman at the market. She wanted to give me dollar two for the stone. The father then said, My son, now I want you to take this rock to the museum, and if you are asked the price, raise two fingers and don't say a word. Once again, do not accept any offer and bring the stone back to me. The boy took the stone, then went to the museum. After a while, there was a middle-aged man who approached the boy and asked for the price. The boy didn't say a word and raised up two fingers, and the man asked, Two hundred dollars? The boy did not say anything once again as advised by his father. The man said, Okay, I'll take it. The boy was shocked and ran back home to his father, shouting and said, Father, father, a man in the museum wanted to buy the stone for dollar two hundred. The father replied, Okay, son, the last place... I want you to take this stone is to a precious stone store. Walk inside and show it only to the owner. Don't say a word if he asks the price and just raise two fingers. As you did earlier, do not accept any offer and bring the stone back to me. The son then went to the precious stone store and showed the stone to the owner. Oh my God, where did you find this? 
the owner asked. This is a most precious, unpolished gem, one of the most valuable in the whole world. I must have it. What price would you take for it? The boy didn't say anything and raised two fingers to which the man replied, Two million dollars. That is a bargain. I'll take it. The boy couldn't believe it. The boy, not knowing what to say, went breathlessly, running home to his father, anxiously clutching this now priceless gem, terrified that he might lose it. The boy said, Father, a precious store owner, wants to buy this stone for two million dollars. The father then said, Son, you have been carrying in your hands one of the most precious objects of our people. It is truly priceless. The father continues, My dear son, do you now understand the value of your life? Life is all about where you put yourself. You can decide if you want to be a $2 stone or a $2 million stone. The value of your life is much like that stone. Someone sees it having a worth of $2, others $200, and still few see $2 million. You must surround yourself with other precious souls who recognize the greatest value of your life because it is one of your most prized possession, and you must not allow it to be undervalued. It does not matter where you come from, where you were born, or the color of your skin. You just need to put yourself at right place. Not all people will understand your value or appreciate you. Your life lies in your hands. It's up to you to make it a better. Another message the story culminates is, do not forget your individual worth or lose faith in yourself. In spite of having qualities, people may ignore, criticize, and discourage you to make you feel inferior. You need to understand the value you carry inside and move forward in life. 9. A Lesson in Giving Many years ago, when I worked as a transfusion volunteer at a hospital, I got to know a little three-year-old girl suffering from a disease. The little girl needed blood from her five-year-old brother, who had miraculously survived the same condition. The boy had developed the antibodies needed to combat the illness and was the only hope for his sister. The doctor explained the situation to the little brother and asked if the boy would give his blood to his sister. I saw him hesitate only for a moment before he took a deep breath and said, Yes, I will do it if it will save my sister. As the transfusion progressed, he lay in bed next to his sister and smiled, seeing the color returning to her cheeks. Then his face grew pale and his smile faded. Finally, he looked up at the nurse beside him and asked with a trembling voice, When will I start to die? The young boy had misunderstood the doctor and thought he had to die to save his sick sister. 10. A Boat for All Feelings Once there was an island where all the feelings and emotions lived together. One day, a big storm from the sea was about to drown the island. Every emotion on the island was scared, but love made a boat to escape. All the feelings jumped in the boat except for one sense. Love got down to see who it was. It was Ego. Love tried its best to bring Ego to the boat, but Ego didn't move. Everyone asked Love to leave Ego and come in the boat, but Love was meant to love. It remained with Ego. All other feelings were left alive, but Love died because of Ego. 11. The Blind Girl The star of this story is the blind girl. Unfortunately, this girl hated herself, purely based on the fact that she was blind. Her boyfriend, whom she loved dearly, was always there for her. She often said she would marry him if only she could see the world. One day, whether it be a miracle or the incredible power of science, she could finally see everything. The story states that this was only made possible through a kind donation. Her dream came true and she could now see her boyfriend. He asked her to marry him, as that was her promise. However, the girl was shocked to discover that her boyfriend was also blind. She refused to marry him and broke his heart. He walked away in tears. The girl later discovered that her boyfriend was the donor, and with the donation, he lost his sight. 
Though rather far-fetched, this short story is a fantastic lesson. The takeaway of the story. When our circumstances change, our mind changes too. Not only do you have to stay true to yourself and appreciate everything, but you never know what's happening behind closed doors. 12. The Story of the Fig Tree I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was E.G., the amazing editor, and another fig was Europe and Africa and South America, and another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila, and a pack of other lovers with queer names and offbeat professions, and another fig was an Olympic lady crew champion, and beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest, and as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one they plopped to the ground at my feet. Decide! Take action! There's no right or wrong answer when you're choosing between two positive routes or outcomes. Wait too long and the decision will be made for you. Chinshu. 13. Shake off your problems. A man's favorite donkey falls into a deep precipice. He can't pull it out no matter how hard he tries. He therefore decides to bury it alive. Soil is poured onto the donkey from above. The donkey feels the load, shakes it off, and steps on it. More soil is poured. It shakes it off and steps up. The more the load was poured, the higher it rose. By noon, the donkey was grazing in green pastures. After much shaking off of problems and stepping up, learning from them, one will graze in green pastures. 14. The weight was wrong. Drew Carey has spent much of his career in the spotlight. Fans of the comedic actor remember him as the overweight star of the Drew Carey show. He shocked his following by appearing on his new job as the host of the The Price is Right, a full 80 pounds lighter. There was no magic trick to his weight loss. Carey lost weight the old-fashioned way by counting calories and logging 45-minute cardio sessions on the treadmill. Remember, you don't have to try the newest fad. Find what works for you and just stick with it. Little by little, you will reach your goals. 15. Being and Breathing One warm evening many years ago, after spending nearly every waking minute with Angel for eight straight days, I knew that I had to tell her just one thing. So late at night, just before she fell asleep, I whispered it in her ear. She smiled, the kind of smile that makes me smile back, and she said, When I'm 75 and I think about my life and what it was like to be young, I hope that I can remember this very moment. A few seconds later, she closed her eyes and fell asleep. The room was peaceful, almost silent. All I could hear was the soft purr of her breathing. I stayed awake thinking about the time we'd spent together and all the choices in our lives that made this moment possible. And at some point, I realized that it didn't matter what we'd done or where we'd gone, nor did the future hold any significance. All that mattered was the serenity of the moment, just being with her and breathing with her. The moral. We must not allow the clock, the calendar, and external pressures to rule our lives and blind us to the fact that each individual moment of our lives is a beautiful mystery and a miracle, especially those moments we spend in the presence of a loved one. 16. The Drunkard The Drunkard is a story with a moral about seeking truth and wisdom, a policeman sees a drunk man searching for something under a streetlight and asks what the drunk has lost. He says he lost his keys and they both look under the streetlight together. 
After a few minutes, the policeman asks if he is sure he lost them here, and the drunk replies, no, and that he lost them in the park. The policeman asks why he is searching here, and the drunk replies, this is where the light is. Truth and wisdom are found where you least want to look. 17. Learning to be silent. The very last of our stories with a moral is a koan about the immensely difficult task of holding one's tongue. A koan is a puzzling Zen story intended to reveal a greater truth, but it's as relevant as ever in the age of the social media pile on. The pupils of the Tendai school used to study meditation before Zen entered Japan. Four of them who were intimate friends promised one another to observe seven days of silence. On the first day, all were silent. Their meditation had begun auspiciously, but when night came and the oil lamps were growing dim, one of the pupils could not help exclaiming to a servant, Fix those lamps. The second pupil was surprised to hear the first one talk. We are not supposed to say a word, he remarked. You two are stupid. Why did you talk? asked the third. I am the only one who has not talked, concluded the fourth pupil. As opposed to logic, stories can mean different things to different people. The moral you take from one of our stories might differ. Perhaps you recognize something else in them depending on how the narrative relates to a personal experience. This is what makes the difference between a memorable life lesson and shallow fridge magnet wisdom. So feel free to collect, memorize, and retell the stories and distill each one into your own thought-provoking quote or aphorism about life. 18. Shark Bait During a research experiment, a marine biologist placed a shark into a large holding tank and then released several small bait fish into the tank. As you would expect, the shark quickly swam around the tank, attacked, and ate the smaller fish. The marine biologist then inserted a strong piece of clear fiberglass into the tank, creating two separate partitions. She then put the shark on one side of the fiberglass and a new set of bait fish on the other. Again, the shark quickly attacked. This time, however, the shark slammed into the fiberglass divider and bounced off. Undeterred, the shark kept repeating this behavior every few minutes to no avail. Meanwhile, the bait fish swam around unharmed in the second partition. Eventually, about an hour into the experiment, the shark gave up. This experiment was repeated several dozen times over the next few weeks. Each time, the shark got less aggressive and made fewer attempts to attack the bait fish, until eventually the shark got tired of hitting the fiberglass divider and simply stopped attacking altogether. The marine biologist then removed the fiberglass divider, but the shark didn't attack. The shark was trained to believe a barrier existed between it and the bait fish, so the bait fish swam wherever they wished, free from harm. The Moral Many of us, after experiencing setbacks and failures, emotionally give up and stop trying. Like the shark in the story, we believe that because we were unsuccessful in the past, we will always be unsuccessful. In other words, we continue to see a barrier in our heads, even when no real barrier exists between where we are and where we want to go. 19. To Build a Fire by Jack London The trouble with him was that he was without imagination. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things, and not in the significances. Fifty degrees below zero meant eighty-odd degrees of frost. Such fact impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable, and that was all. Summary To Build a Fire is a short story by Jack London, first published in 1908. The story follows an unnamed man traveling through the Yukon wilderness on foot with his dog. Despite warnings from an experienced old-timer, the man sets out alone in frigid temperatures and attempts to build a fire to keep warm. However, when he encounters several setbacks, 
he ultimately succumbs to the cold while his dog manages to survive. Theme. To build a fire portrays the power and indifference of nature. It highlights the brutal conditions of the Yukon wilderness and the harsh reality that even the most prepared and experienced individuals can be no match for the forces of nature. While it's not inspirational in the traditional sense, it offers an important lesson about human fragility and our role in the world. Moral of the story. London's story highlights the importance of respecting and understanding the power of nature while limiting overconfidence. This is a cautionary tale against arrogance and hubris, and it emphasizes the importance of caution and humility when facing the unpredictable and unforgiving forces of nature. 20. Self-Appraisal one beautiful winter morning, when the sun was fairly up in the sky, a little boy reached on a grocery shop having telephone booth in it. He saw a soda carton. He reached to the carton and pulled it near the telephone booth. Then, he climbed onto the carton so that he could reach the buttons on the phone and proceeded to punch in ten digits. The store owner observed and curiously listened to the conversation the boy had. Little boy asked, Madam, I am a poor boy. Can you give me the job of grass cutting in your lawn? Woman, at the other end of the phone line, replied, Sorry, I already have someone to cut my lawn. Little boy said, Madam, I will cut your lawn for half the price of the person who cuts your lawn now. Woman replied, I'm very satisfied with the person who is presently cutting my lawn. He is doing a good job. Little boy, with more perseverance, said, Madam, I'll even sweep your curb and your sidewalk so on Sunday you will have the prettiest lawn in all of Palm Beach, Florida. Woman, no, thank you. With a smile on his face, the little boy replaced the receiver. The store owner, who was listening to all this conversation, walked over to the boy. Store owner said, Son, I liked your attitude. I also liked your positive spirit and would like to offer you a job. Boy replied, no thanks. I appreciate your job offer to me. Store owner said, But you were really pleading for one when you were talking to the lady over phone. He little boy replied, No, sir. I was just checking my performance at the job I already have. I am the one who is working for that lady I was talking to. This is what we call self-appraisal. In fact, it's not only self-appraisal, it's proactive self-appraisal. This inspiring story encourages seeking proactive feedback. Always try to get feedback from others and be ready to work constructively on that. These feedback help you to take corrective actions before things getting worse. Not only this, those feedback will boost your self-confidence when you receive a positive one on your work, like happened with the little boy in the above story. One more thing I would like to mention, if you have noticed every time if you don't get ahead of others, you start blaming others for it. You should look to yourself, self-appraisal, and do a healthy comparison. Find your own weaknesses and work hard to throw away your weaknesses. Nobody will be able to replace you for your current job. 21. Life is a race. Once upon a time, in a small village lived a young, athletic boy. He was a very good runner. One day, that boy participated in running competition held in village. A large crowd had gathered to witness the sporting spectacle, and a wise old man, upon hearing of the little boy, had traveled far to bear the witness also. In that competition, he competed with other two little boys. The race commenced, looking like a level heat at the finishing line. The little boy sure enough called on his determination, power, and strength. He took the winning line and came first. The crowd was ecstatic and cheered and waved at him. Little boy felt proud and important. The wise man, however, remained still and calm, expressing no sentiment. Later, a second race was called, and in this race, two new young and fit challengers came forward and run in competition with little boy. The race was started, and sure enough, the little boy came through and finished first once again. 
crowd was ecstatic again and cheered and waved at the little boy. The wise man remained still and calm, again expressing no sentiment. The little boy, however, again felt proud and more important. He started to plead, another race, another race. Seeing this, the wise old man stepped forward and presented the little boy with two new challengers. Among new challengers, one was an elderly, frail old lady, and other was a blind man. What's this? quizzed the little boy. This is no race, he exclaimed. Old wise man replied, race. After all, we're set on starting line. Race started and boy was only one to finish that race leaving two challengers standing at the starting line. The little boy was ecstatic and raised his arms in delight. But to his surprise, this time no one from crowd was cheering. Everyone was just looking at him silently, showing no sentiment. What has happened? Why not do the people join in my success? Little boy asked. Wise old man. Wise old man replied, Race again, but this time finish together. All three of you, must finish together. Little boy thought for a while and then again went to starting line and stood in middle of frail old lady and the blind man. Then he took both the challengers by the hand. The race began and the little boy started to walk slowly, ever so slowly, to the finishing line and crossed it. This time at end of race crowd was delighted. They smiled, cheered, and waved at the little boy. The wise old man smiled, gently nodding his head. Little boy felt proud, but still didn't understand why crowd was not cheering him before, but now cheering when all three of them finished race together. He asked old man about it. Old man, I understand not. Who are the crowd cheering for? Which one of us three? The wise old man looked into the little boy's eyes, placing his hands on the boy's shoulders. He replied softly, Little boy, in this race you have won much more than in any race you have ever run before. You have won people's respect. And for this race crowd, cheer not for any winner. They cheer to show the respect how you ran. You see in life, your life, what are you running for? Are you hungry for success? Is winning the only measurement of success for you in your life? Who are you running against? If you always win against everybody, then soon the people will stop cheering for you. At the end of your life, if you look back. The question is, who was running next to you in the race? If they were weaker and old, did you help them to get across the line? Did you all finish together? Because that is the best race you can ever run. So run, run this race called life. But don't forget, it is not important if you win. It is important how you run this race. 22. Our Value A well-known speaker started off his seminar by holding up a $20 bill. In the room of 200, he asked, Who would like this dollar, 20 bill? Hands started going up. He said, I am going to give this $20 to one of you, but first, let me do this. He proceeded to crumple the dollar bill up. He then asked, who still wants it? Still, the hands were up in the air. Well, he replied, what if I do this? And he dropped it on the ground and started to grind it into the floor with his shoe. He picked it up, now all crumpled and dirty. Now who still wants it? Still, the hands went into the air. My friends, you have all learned a very valuable lesson. No matter what I did to the money, you still wanted it because it did not decrease in value. It was still worth $1.20. Many times in our lives, we are dropped, crumpled, and ground into the dirt by the decisions we make and the circumstances that come our way. We feel as though we are worthless. But no matter what has happened or what will happen, you will never lose your value. You are special. Don't ever forget it. 23. Life is like a cup of coffee. A group of best friends decided to have their alumni get together at the residence of one of their favorite university professor. The professor was very popular among university students and had been mentor for many of them. 
they finalized to make a surprise visit to Professor. All planning was done, and on predefined date, they visited their most popular and old university professor's house. It was quite a happy moment for not only Professor, but even for the all friends, students of Professor, also as some of them were meeting after a long time. Everyone was trying to know whereabouts and the developments in their friend's life after leaving college. They shared with each other. How did they move ahead in life? Few became a good leaders having senior positions in corporate world, whereas few were doing good in the business world. All of them had got married and having wonderful family. Everyone had his, her own timing of life in achieving the milestones. There was quality conversation going on, but somehow the conversation soon diverted to complaints about work, relationships, stress, and tension in life. The professor offered them coffee and went to kitchen to ask his wife to prepare coffee for all his students. After 10, 15 minutes, his beautiful wife came with a pleasant smile. One thing was to be noticed that she brought coffee in different kinds of cups. Crystal cups, glass cups, ceramic cups, shining ones, some plain looking, some ordinary, some exquisite and some expensive ones. The students thought that professor may not have the same kind of cups and due to large number of guests, his wife has served the coffee in different cups. When all of them had a cup in hand, the professor said, if you noticed, all the nice looking and expensive cups are taken up, leaving behind the ordinary, plain and cheap ones. It was a surprising moment as nobody noticed that there were some extra cups of coffee and while having their cup, nobody took the ordinary cups and all of them were left on the serving tray. The professor continued, every one of you wanted the best cups. While it is, of course, normal for you to want only the best for yourselves, that can also be the source of much of your dissatisfaction, problems, and stress and tension in life. All the friends got confused and were looking towards Professor. They could not understand. What's the connection with having a coffee in chosen cup with the stress and tension of life? Professor continued further and explained after seeing their curious face, be assured that the cup itself adds no quality to the coffee. In most cases, it is just more expensive, and in some cases, even it hides what we drink. What you really wanted was coffee, not the cup. But you consciously went for the best cups, and then you began eyeing each other's cups. Always remember one thing, if life is coffee, and jobs, money, status, or position in society and love, etc., are the cups. They are just tools to hold and contain life. The type of cup we have does not define or change the quality of life we live. Please don't let the cups drive you. Enjoy the coffee. Moral of motivational story. Most of the people concentrate only on the cup and fail to enjoy the coffee. We keep our focus on outside beauty and appearance, whereas the real quality and value lies inside. Savor the coffee and not the cups. The happiest people in this world don't have the best of everything. They just make the best out of everything. Sure, a nice looking cup may help make the experience of drinking the coffee interesting, but no cup in the world, no matter how exquisite, can ever compensate for the horrid taste of bad coffee. In fact, it'd be undrinkable. So coffee inside cup is more important than the cup itself. At the end of the day, it is vital to know what does make you happy and what does complete you. There is no need to fret too much about how the cup looks like from outside. It is about the quality of its content. And we define what that very content means to us. Don't run for money, success, career, status, and prized possessions. Always try to live life with full of mindfulness. The true meaning of life is not materialistic achievements, but going that extra mile in the journey of life which enlighten you the real purpose of it. 24. Stopped by a brick. A successful young executive was riding his brand new Jaguar down a neighborhood street when he noticed a kid darting out from between parked cars. 
He slowed down a little bit as he appeared near it, and a brick smashed into his car's door. He slammed on the brakes and drove back to the place where the brick had been thrown. The furious man jumped out of his car and caught the nearest kid shouting, What was that all about? What the heck did you do to my car? Why did you do it? The young boy was a little scared but was very polite and apologetic. I am sorry, mister. I didn't know what else to do, he pleaded. I had to throw the brick because no one else would stop for my call to help. With tears rolling down his cheeks, he pointed towards the parked cars and said, It's my brother. He rolled off the curb and fell off his wheelchair and he is badly hurt. I can't lift him. The sobbing boy asked the man, Would you please help me get him back into his wheelchair? He is hurt and he is too heavy for me. The young man was moved beyond words and tried to swallow the rapidly swelling lump in his throat. Then he hurriedly lifted the other kid from the spot and put him back in the wheelchair. He also helped the little kid with his bruises and cuts. When he thought that everything would be okay, he went back to his car. Thank you, sir, and God bless you, said the grateful kid. The young man was too shaken up for any word, so the man watched the little boy push the brother who uses a wheelchair down the sidewalk. It was a long and slow ride back home to the man, when he came out of the car, he looked at his dented car door. The damage was very noticeable, but he did not bother to repair it. Instead, he kept the dent to remind him of the message. Do not go through life so fast that someone has to throw a brick at you to get your attention. Life whispers in our souls and speaks to our hearts. Sometimes when we do not listen to it, it throws a brick at us. It is our choice. Listen to the whisper or wait for the brick. 25. 20 dollar bill. A well-known speaker started his seminar by holding up a brand new twenty dollar bill. In the room filled with people, he asked if anyone would like to have his dollar twenty bill. Hands in the room started going up. He crumpled and crumbled the bill and asked the crowd if anyone was still interested in having the bill. The hands were still up, signing that people still wanted the crumpled dollar, 20 bill. He then dropped the bill on the ground and started to grind it into the floor with his shoe. He picked up, now crumpled and dirty dollar, 20 bill. Does anyone still want the bill? He asked. Still, the hands went into the air. The speaker said, Today, we have all learned a valuable lesson. No matter what I did to the bill, you still wanted it because it did not lose its value. Many times in our lives we are dropped, crumpled, and ground into the dirt by the decisions we make and the circumstances that come our way. We may feel as if we are worthless, but no matter what happened or what will happen, you will never lose your value. Dirty or clean, crumpled or finely creased, we are priceless. The worth of our lives comes not from where we are from or who we know, but from who we are. 26. Find happiness. Once a group of 50 people were attending a seminar. Suddenly the speaker stopped and decided to do a group activity. He started giving each attendee one balloon. Each one was asked to write his her name on it using a marker pen. Then all the balloons were collected and put in another room. Now these delegates were led into that room and asked to find the balloon, which had their name written within five minutes. Everyone was frantically searching for their name, colliding with each other, pushing around others, and there was utter chaos. At the end of five minutes, no one could find their own balloon. Now each one was asked to randomly collect a balloon and give it to the person whose name was written on it. Within minutes, everyone had their own balloon. The speaker then began, This is happening in our lives. Everyone is frantically looking for happiness all around, not knowing where it is. Our happiness lies in the happiness of other people. Give them their happiness. You will get your own happiness. And this is the purpose of human life, the pursuit of happiness. 27. The Clever General 
Thousands of years ago, there was a famous Chinese general with a reputation for being an astute and cunning leader. One day, at the end of a long campaign, this general decided to stop in a stronghold with a small battalion of soldiers, sending his main fighting force ahead to rest elsewhere. Meanwhile, one of his enemies catches wind of this and decides to march his army of hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the general's all but defenseless position. In the middle of the night, the general's awoken by one of his men, who breaks the news. The enemy's close. They'll be there before daybreak and the tiny band of soldiers in the stronghold will be no match for their numbers. Hearing this, the general stops and pauses. Understanding his predicament, he instructs his men to stand down, open the gates, take down the banners from the walls, and hide. The general then removes his armor, dons a cloak, and sits on the battlements playing a mandolin as he looks out at the approaching army. The enemy leader soon arrives. He recognizes the general immediately and orders his forces to halt. He stops to think. He knows this general better than anyone, including his reputation for wily deeds and setting deadly traps. He waits some more. The presence of this infamous general sitting there with such nonchalance makes him question himself. Was the information he received false? Is the general luring him into a trap? Or is it a double bluff? Is this a ploy to make him question himself and the general is, in fact, as defenseless as he seems? He waits some more, and then he orders his forces to retreat. First, your reputation is crucial and can deliver all sorts of positive outcomes. Second, there's often a cleverer, more strategic way to achieve your goals. Never assume it takes sweat, blood, and tears. Look for a method of attaining the same results with less effort. 28. The Right Place a mother and a baby camel were lying around under a tree. Then the baby camel asked, Why do camels have humps? The mother camel considered this and said, We are desert animals, so we have the humps to store water so we can survive with very little water. The baby camel thought for a moment, then said, Okay, why are our legs long and our feet rounded? The mama replied, They are meant for walking in the desert. The baby paused. After a beat, the camel asked, Why are our eyelashes long? Sometimes they get in my way. The mama responded, Those long, thick eyelashes protect your eyes from the desert sand when it blows in the wind. The baby thought and thought. Then he said, I see. So the hump is to store water when we are in the desert. The legs are for walking through the desert, and these eyelashes protect my eyes from the desert, then why in the zoo? The lesson. Skills and abilities are only useful if you are in the right place at the right time. Otherwise, they go to waste. 29. The Scorpion and the Frog The Scorpion and the Frog is a fable about trust, human nature, and malevolence. One of the many versions goes as follows. A scorpion asks a frog to carry him over a river. The frog is afraid of being stung, but the scorpion argues that if it did so, both would sink and the scorpion would drown. The frog then agrees, but midway across the river the scorpion does indeed sting the frog, dooming them both. When asked why, the scorpion points out that this is its nature. You can't outsmart human nature. Be realistic about changing vicious people. Sometimes they even act against their own interests. 30. St. George in Retirement St. George in Retirement is a story about obsession. It's a variation of the legend of St. George and the Dragon and was penned by Australian philosopher Kenny Minogue to illustrate the history of liberalism. After many centuries of hopelessness and superstition, St. George, in the guise of rationality, appeared in the world somewhere about the 16th century. The first dragons upon whom he turned his lance were those of despotic kingship and religious intolerance. These battles won, he rested for a time, until such questions as slavery or 
prison conditions or the state of the poor began to command his attention. During the 19th century, his lance was never still, prodding this way and that against the inert scaliness of privilege, vested interest, or patrician insolence. But, unlike St. George, he did not know when to retire. The more he succeeded, the more he became bewitched with the thought of a world free of dragons, and the less capable he became of ever returning to private life. He needed his dragons. He could only live by fighting for causes. The people, the poor, the exploited, the colonially oppressed, the underprivileged, and the underdeveloped. As an aging warrior, he grew breathless in his pursuit of smaller and smaller dragons, for the big dragons were now harder to come by. Not knowing when to quit is the first step of the descent into madness. Beware of St. George and Retirement Syndrome, the obsession with pursuing a laudable goal. 31. The Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy Remember then, there is only one time that is important, now. It is the most important time because it is the only time when we have any power. Summary The Three Questions is a short story by Russian author Leo Tolstoy that was published in 1903. The story follows a king seeking answers to three questions. What is the best time to do things? Who is the most important person? What is the right thing to do? He offers a reward for the answers to these questions and consults with various advisors and wise men, but none can give him satisfactory responses. Eventually, he learns the answers to his questions through his own experiences and actions. Theme The three questions portrays the importance of living in the present moment and taking personal action. The story emphasizes the futility of worrying about the past or the future and highlights the importance of engaging fully in all of life's moments. Moral of the story The story teaches that the answers to life's big questions can only be found through action and experience rather than through intellectual inquiry alone. Tolstoy shows that the best way to live is with compassion and kindness toward others. It also encourages readers to cultivate a sense of mindfulness rather than being preoccupied with the past or the future. 32. Everything Happens for Good This is an old story of a king in India who had a very close friend with whom he grew up. The king used to spend his lot of time along with his best friend. His friend had a habit of looking at every situation that ever occurred in his life positive or negative, with optimism and remarking, this is good, everything happens for good. He always tried to look at the things with different perspective and find out positive impacts of whatever happens in life. The gun misfired and blown off the thumb of the king. His friend had apparently done something wrong while loading and preparing the gun. Both of them got shocked and immediately first aid was done. After this, examining the situation, the friend remarked as usual, This is good. Everything happens for good. The king got angry that my thumb has been blown off due to his mistake. Still, his friend is saying, This is good. The king replied with annoyance, No, this is not good. And immediately ordered to send his friend to jail. About a couple of months later, the king was hunting in an area that he should have known to avoid. Cannibals captured him and took him to their village. They tied his both hands, collected some wood, set up a stake, and bound him to the stake. As they came close to set fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing a thumb. Being superstitious cannibals, they never ate anyone that was less than whole. So the cannibals untied the king and sent him on his way. As the king returned home, he remembered the incident that had blown off his thumb and felt sad for his treatment to his friend. The king immediately went to the jail to apologize. The king requested his friend to forgive him and said, You were right. It was good that my thumb was blown off on that day during hunting. 
and he proceeded to tell the friend all that had just happened and how cannibals freed him due to his missing thumb. The kind said, I am very sorry for sending you to jail after getting annoyed on that day. It was a bad decision on my part. Please forgive me. No, his friend replied. That was good. Everything happens for good. The king got surprised with his positivity and asked, What do you mean? How was that good? How could it be good in any way that I sent my friend to jail for a couple of months? Questioned the king. His friend smiled and replied, If I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. The cannibals would have killed me and made me their food. Whatever happens in life, happens for good. Every incident in life has connection with future incidents, which we are not able to see at that point of time. We are only able to relate it back once that connecting future incident happens. When we connect those past incidents, we realize the significance. Therefore, we should always be optimistic and look brighter parts of the things. The story also inspires to practice gratitude in life. Whatever happens, we should be thankful for what we have instead of getting sad about what we have lost. We must focus our spotlight on the positive parts and look at the things with wholeness. 33. Poseidon Poseidon is a Kafkaesque short story about ego and hubris by, well, Franz Kafka. Poseidon was sitting at his desk working. The administration of all the waters was a huge task. He could have had as many assistants as he wanted, and in fact, he did have a large staff, but since he took his job very seriously and went through all the calculations himself anyway, assistants were of little use to him. One couldn't say that the work made him happy either. He only did it because it was his to do. Yes, he had often requested happier work, as he put it, but whenever they came back to him with suggestions, it turned out that nothing appealed to him as much as what he was doing. It was actually very difficult to find anything else for him. It was hardly possible to put him in charge of a particular sea, quite apart from the fact that the calculations involved were no less onerous, just more trivial, since great Poseidon was only ever in line for an executive post. And if he was offered a job in a different department, the very thought of it was enough to turn his stomach. His divine breath became restless. His bronze thorax quaked. Not that they took his complaints all that seriously. If a great power kicks up, then you have to be seen to give in to him, even in the most hopeless cause. No one seriously thought of having Poseidon removed from office. He had been god of the seas from the beginning of time, and would have to remain such. The thing that most angered him, and this was the principal cause of his unhappiness in his job, was when he got to hear what people thought it involved, that is, forever parting the waves with his trident. And when all the time he was sitting at the bottom of the ocean up to his ears in figures, the occasional visit to Jupiter was really the only break in the monotony, a visit, moreover, from which he usually returned in a towering bad temper. He hardly ever clapped eyes on the seas, only fleetingly on his hurried way up to Olympus, and he had never sailed them as such. He tended to say he was waiting for the world to end first, because there was bound to be a quiet moment just before the end when he had signed off on his last calculation and would be able to take himself on a little cruise somewhere. The only thing more insane than the modern office workplace is what we make of it. Too often, it's our ego that's keeping us from walking away. 34. The Retiring Carpenter There was a highly skilled carpenter who was just about to retire. He was retiring after a long and dedicated career in building houses. He was master in his work and was extremely famous for his extraordinary work. At the very beginning of his career, when he joined a prominent contractor, he had been required to make a very special promise. The carpenter had to promise the contractor that every house he built would be built as if it was the most important project he had ever been given. He also had to promise that every house would be built with full of creativity, dedication, love, and care. 
Getting ready to retire, the carpenter went into his boss's office to inform him about his plans. The carpenter said, The house I have just completed would be my last. I would like to retire from the services now. The boss said, I'm sorry to see you are leaving our organization. May I request you to be kind enough to do a final favor for me? The carpenter replied, Please, sir, tell me what can I do for you? The boss said, Just build me one more house, then you're free to go. The carpenter, who respected his boss to a great extent, agreed and immediately started to work on the new house. But unlike every other house he had built over the past few years, he didn't use the full extent of his expertise with this final one. He took every shortcut he knew to finish the project in record time. The only reason behind it was he wanted to begin his second innings after retirement at the earliest. He cut corners, used inferior material, and hurried to get the task over with. Within weeks, the carpenter completed the house. And finally, the carpenter called his employer and showed him the house. The employer was very happy and grateful to him. He said to the carpenter in a gentle tone, Thanks for doing this personal favor for me. Then the employer handed over the carpenter some papers and keys to the front door and said, These are for you. The house you just built is my parting gift for all your years of hard work and dedication. The carpenter was astounded. He could not believe that the home he had just built was his own. If he had known this, he would have put his very best into it. The motivational story, The Retiring Carpenter, communicates a very strong message. You must keep your promises and fulfill your commitments. The carpenter broke his early promise. He failed to keep the promise he had made to his employer and to himself, the promise that he would do his work with excellence and true mastery of his craft. As a result, he did not put in his full efforts to build his own house. Just because he breached his commitment, he ended up living in the only inferior home that he had ever built. Similarly, in our life we break promises and end up living in less than ideal circumstances, circumstances that we have created by our own actions. The short, motivational story makes us to realize that whatever we do in our day-to-day -day life, we should do it with utmost passion and love, just like it's for your own self. 35. Sharpen Your Axe Once upon a time, there were two woodcutters named Charles and John. Both of them were from same town. They were often at loggerheads over who chopped more wood. So one beautiful morning, they decided to hold a wood-cutting competition to determine the winner between them. The rules of competition were pretty simple. Whoever produces the most wood in a day wins. They moved towards woodland nearby. Both of them took up their positions in the jungle and started cutting away trees in their fastest possible speed. Chop, chop, chop. The sound of axes hitting wood echoed throughout the forest, and both contestants matched the opponent stroke for stroke. This lasted for an hour, and all of a sudden Charles stopped. When John noticed that there was no chopping sound from Charles's side, he thought, Aha! Charles must be tired already! And he continued to chop down his trees with double motivation and pace. A quarter of an hour passed, and John heard his opponent chopping again. After this, both Charles and John carried on synchronously. John was starting to feel exhausted, and the chopping from Charles stopped once again. Feeling motivated and sensing victory close by, John continued on with a huge smile on his face. But after 15 minutes, John could hear the chopping sound again from Charles' end. John brought his all energy together and kept cutting the trees to go ahead with the competition. This went on the whole day. Every hour, Charles would stop chopping the wood for 15 minutes while John kept going persistently. So, in the evening when the competition ended, John was totally confident that he would take the triumph. But to John's surprise, Charles had actually chopped down more wood. With a disappointing face, John asked, How did this even happen? How could you have cut down more trees than me? You worked for less time than me. 
I heard you stop working every hour for fifteen minutes. Charles smiled and replied, Well, John, it's in fact very simple. Every time I stopped work, while you were still chopping down trees, I was sharpening my axe. In today's competitive environment, everybody, everywhere seems to be busy. Most of the people are just too busy doing and trying to achieve success like John. They do not spare essential time required to enhance their knowledge and renew themselves, to learn and grow, to sharpen the axe. 36. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Summary the Gift of the Magi is a short story written in 1905 by O. Henry. It's about a young couple, Jim and Della, who are struggling to make ends meet during the Christmas season. Despite their financial difficulties, they each want to buy a special gift for the other. They end up making sacrifices to do so, each giving up something they treasure to please the other. Theme the Gift of the Magi displays the true meaning of gift-giving, which is about the thought and love behind the gift rather than its material value. The couple's gifts to each other are ultimately meaningless in terms of their practical use, but their representation of love and sacrifice proves to be invaluable for both Jim and Della. Moral of the Story The story highlights the benevolent spirit of gift-giving, and reminds readers that the value of a gift is not in how much money was spent on it, but in the thought and love behind it. 37. The Black and White Pebble In a small Italian village, hundreds of years ago, a farmer had the misfortune of owing a large sum of money to a village moneylender, Loan Shark. The moneylender was old, unattractive-looking, unmarried guy, and fancied marrying the farmer's beautiful daughter. He made a plan to pressurize the farmer to repay the loan. He went to the farms, where farmer and his daughter were working. The moneylender asked farmer for repayment of outstanding loans. The farmer asked the moneylender to give some more time to return the loan. The moneylender pretended to be furious for a while and then proposed a bargain. He said that, if the farmer would not repay his debt, he would be punished, or he had an option to let the moneylender marry his daughter, and all his debt would be waived. Needless to say, this proposal was met with a look of disgust. Both the farmer and his daughter were horrified by the proposal. There was no way the farmer could pay back the large amount of money soon, and he did not want his beautiful daughter to marry the old and cruel moneylender. To persuade the farmer to accept his deal, cunning moneylender suggested that they let Providence decide the matter. He told them that he would put a black pebble and a white pebble into an empty bag. The girl, then, had to choose a pebble which would decide her fate. In any case, the shrewd old moneylender wanted to make the proposal look fairer to the young lady. So he proposed tricky conditions. If she picked the black pebble, she would have to marry the moneylender and her father's debt would be forgiven. If she picked the white pebble, she did not need marry the moneylender and her father's debt would still be forgiven. If she refuses to pick the pebble, the farmer would be thrown into jail. As they were standing on a pebble-strewn path in the farmer's field, the moneylender bent over to pick up two pebbles and kept them in a bag. He, however, kept two black pebbles in the bag instead of a black and a white. The sharp-eyed girl noticed it and was confused what to do. She knew that she was being cheated by the moneylender. 38. Happiness is within you. Once upon a time, an affluent man lived in a city. He was a very successful businessman with abundance of wealth. But still, he was always worried and restless. One day he went to meet a sage in his hermitage, 
which was situated in the forest next to a nearby village. When the man met with the sage, he shared his problem with sage, that he has no shortage of anything, but still, he is always worried. Next day, the man reached the hermitage of the sage at the same time. He saw that the sage was looking for something outside his hermitage. The person asked, What are you looking for? May I help you? The sage replied, I have lost my ring and I am searching for the same. After hearing this, the person also started searching for ring along with the sage. Even after searching for a long time, the ring was not found. And then the person asked the sage, Where did your ring fall exactly? Want to know your happiness index level? Check out How Happy Are You? Take this quick quiz to see where you measure up on the happiness index. The sage said, My ring fell in the hut of the hermitage, but it is very dark there, so I am looking for the ring here outside the hut. The person got surprised and asked, If your ring fell in the hut, then why are you looking out here? How will you find the thing here outside, which is inside there? The sage smiled and replied, My dear son, this is the solution to your problem. The person was looking toward Sage with curious eyes. The Sage continued, You came with the problem that you have no shortage of anything, but still you are not happy with your life. Happiness is right there inside you, but you are looking for it outside in the materialistic world that is money and foreign goods. The Sage added with smiling face, the entire ocean is inside you, but still you are looking for water outside with a spoon. Money or property is important in life, but happiness cannot be bought only with money. Look for the happiness within you. It's there, and you do not need to search for it in the outside world. The rich man was enlightened. The sage had communicated the message in a very powerful way. This worked as food for thought and gave the rich man an opportunity to introspect. He worked on the advice of Sage and found the happiness within him. We often search outside ourselves for the happiness which has been inside all along. Instead of telling the person the secret of happiness during his first visit, the Sage explained it next day with an example. The Sage taught him the lesson connecting with an incident which is always more valuable. The source of happiness is within us. Happiness starts from within us. Happiness often seems to be the result of external factors, but actually the real source of happiness comes from within you. There is inner happiness within everyone, but it is covered by layers of negative thoughts, fears, worries, and anxieties. Inner happiness is an inseparable part of our inner being, of our essence but we often allow various factors to hide it. Happiness in truth lies within you, starting from you and ending with you. Happiness and peace are two basic characters of every soul. You do not even have to chase it or climb a thousand stairs or learn the rocket science to experience it. While many people try to look for happiness through their wealth, career, money, and success, and feel surprised not experience the happiness even when having a penthouse apartment overlooking the London Eye next to Houses of Parliament and earning seven figures per annum. Happiness is something that we choose for ourselves and a way we choose to live our life according to our being. It is not in accordance to someone else's rhythm as merely it is to our own. It is our inner feeling that creates happiness, along with how we interpret the events of life. 39. Black and White Pebbles We've all heard the saying, think outside your box. The saying has become synonymous with creative thinking and being innovative. Obviously, this quality often proves beneficial to people trying to push themselves. This short story is one of the best examples of thinking outside the box, which can be amazing. It began in a small Italian town hundreds of years ago. A small business owner found himself in a large debt to a money loan shark who was old and unattractive. The shark loan was interested in the business owner's daughter. Of course, this meant he offered the businessman a deal. 
he would eliminate the debt if he could marry the businessman's daughter. This proposal was desirable for neither the daughter nor the businessman and was met with disgust. However, it came with a twist. The loan shark would place two pebbles into a bag. One would be white and one would be black. The daughter would then be told to reach into the bag and pick a pebble. The debt would be wiped if the daughter picked the black pebble, but the loan shark would marry her. If the daughter chose the white pebble, the debt would also be wiped, but the daughter would not have to marry the loan shark. The latter is the desirable outcome for both the daughter and the businessman. As the loan shark picked up the two pebbles, the daughter noticed that he had picked up two black stones in an attempt to guarantee his plan. The daughter then had three choices. Refuse altogether to pick any pebble from the bag. Expose the two black pebbles and the loan shark for cheating. Pick a pebble that would determine her horrid fate. Thinking outside the box, the daughter drew out a pebble and decided to drop the stones accidentally on the ground into the midst of the other pebbles. She then told the loan shark that it didn't matter, as they could all decipher which pebble she picked by looking at the pebble left in the other bag. The loan shark did not want to be exposed and played with the fact that the daughter had picked a white pebble. The debt was wiped, and the daughter didn't have to marry the loan shark. The takeaway of the story, use your creative thinking. You can always overcome a challenging situation by stepping outside the box to which it is confined. You may think you have limited options, but there are creative ways to get around it. 40. A funny joke. Once a wise man held a seminar to teach people how to get rid of sorrows in their life. Many people gathered to hear the wise man's words. The man entered the room and told a hilarious joke to the crowd. The crowd roared in laughter. After a couple of minutes, he told them the same joke, and only a few of them smiled. When he told the same joke for the third time, no one laughed anymore. The wise man smiled and said, You can't laugh at the same joke over and over, so why do you cry over the same problem over and over? <laughs>